first of all, uh, thanks for taking time to do this interview, Alex. It's my pleasure. It's uh, it's really an opportunity to, um, I guess, share all the hard work and um, the story behind it. Yeah, sure. Why don't we start with uh, getting to know your know your story, and the why behind what you do? Okay, so I. I I am an artist and a designer, and I went to RISD, and I had a very fortunate group of people with me. It was a very fertile time to be at RISD, some extremely talented artists doing some wonderful things um, all in their career, and especially still now. Um, and uh, when I graduated, I wasn't really sure exactly which direction I wanted to go in. I ran a gallery for a while that I started, um, and I worked uh, creating um, packaging and promotions for other artists, which is sort of an extension of having a gallery, but more into putting their work together for them to present to the world. And um, all around uh, going through and working in... Um, this uh, with creative people and in a freelance way, I uh, secretly started realizing that I uh, truly wanted to spend time with children. I uh, wanted to go and be a teacher, but I didn't really like the school system and the hierarchy and stuff. So I, I ended up, though, staying in the, the freelance way so that I would be able to control what happened when I had a child. And I didn't know when that was going to happen, but I started working towards that. Um, and I worked on some children's books uh, that I started a whole line, which have yet to publish. Uh, the, a lot of work has gone in and out. Um, it's, a, it's an enormous full series for children, uh, teaching them about the alphabet and anthropomorphizing the letters. And it's called The Story of X. So um, possibly in the future I'll get some time to work on that. Um, that would be great to put in an ebook. Uh, so anyway, the whole idea of getting... Um, working in these different fields and uh, especially starting to tap into children was really starting to think about how we learn and how um, playful and creative or how all of that stuff really uh, connects. And so um, I started realizing that uh, once I had uh, was a parent that this was going to be a super exciting time for me. Uh, fast forward to the moment when that happens and I basically realized that there was all this great stuff that I had taken with me um, to uh, be a parent, all of these toys and games and everything. But then uh, there was this uh, disconnect on, so where's all the new stuff? Where's the great new stuff? And, for example, I had worked for a florist uh, for many years, a top-notch New York florist named Kurt Rausch, um, who had been doing work with Gucci and Yves Saint Laurent, all of these um, very high-end brands, creating this very... Um, luxury, uh, beautiful stuff, and the structure of flowers and the how nature makes color in flowers. These were things that I really wanted to be able to explain to a child. And so I had to go through a bunch of uh, sort of research and stuff to connect the dots between um, having a child who's uh, quite young and starting to explain how nature builds things. Um, and one of the things that I really enjoyed was uh, the inventor of kindergarten, Frederick Froebel, had uh, put together these gifts, and they were a successive compiled set of uh, cumulative things where you start with something very simple for a one-year-old, and then you move to two-year-old, and then uh, you keep moving on. Uh, but there's so much structure in the way we learn, and uh, so this was a fascinating connection for me, was to realize that you, know, you give a one-year-old blocks, um, but you give a two-year-old, you know, you give them individual blocks, and they sort of build and pile and whatever. But you don't give um, a bigger block until two because they're really starting to understand this whole idea of prepositions. And they're, they're basically building a framework to think about how the, how the world works. And this idea of successive knowledge and how you um, give the basic ideas, the very simple ones first, and then you can build into how they become more complex piece by piece became... Uh, really interesting for me, and um, so with my complete disappointment of new toys and games in the nature category, and this uh, beginning understanding of how uh, you can really start showing people how things are put together simply in a primarily visual way, that was how it started. I realized that I had the tools to do this, and uh, I was very excited to start designing for children. This, I, I had really, 
I discovered, I, even though I backed into this through and, and pulled in lots of different skills that I had from different parts of my art and design um, toolbox, uh, it really came all together as defining my passion. Um, I discovered what I wanted to do with my life, and this was just tremendously exciting. Right. Sure. Uh, tell us about your latest project, Anigram. It, it kind of fits into your philosophy of learning from nature and teaching kids. Uh, Okay, so um, Anagram is a board game that's a crossword style game, and I'm not allowed to use any of the big brand names because um, that's a problem, but it's like that game that you play with a crossword. Um, and uh, so what you do is instead of using letters uh, for uh, to build a word, then you're going to use body parts to build an animal. Um, I have, actually, I can show a little sure. bit... Um, what the thing is. So here, for example, you've got antennae and shell and spineless and wing, and that's a beetle. Yep. Um, and on the other side, there is uh, there's words on the other side, so you can figure out, uh, you know, uh, which thing it is if you're looking at it and saying, what is this? Are these legs? Are these? Yep. So it's all divided into how to um, classify how an animal moves around, and those are all in green. Mm -hmm. So that's your limbs mm -hmm. and uh, tail, fins, wings. Anything that's on a bilateral organism, like limbs, mm -hmm. will come out as uh, a pair. So if you have one tile for limbs, then that's actually two. Okay. Um, although the fins are a little bit different because there's dorsal fins and there's only one. But anyway, you get the idea. Yep. Um, then you have uh, seeing, hearing, and finding your way around, which is, would be like antennae eyes, ears, uh, sonar, etc. Then you have, um, you know, how do you eat, and those are in red. And so basically you're trying, I'm trying to take uh, a game which is very familiar to everybody, you know, that big game um, is in one-third of American households. I don't know what the statistics are for the rest of the world. But just to realize that, uh, you know, in Words with Friends was incredibly popular. Um, so uh, in taking this, it's, it's taking familiar gameplay and then throwing you into a little bit of a new situation. Mm -hmm. and so you're now building an animal yeah. from these body parts. Yeah. And because you have a picture, uh, you can have a pretty reader playing this. So mm -hmm. you can actually get this down to maybe four, and depending upon your kid, three years old. Because if you look at a cat or you know what a cat looks like, yeah. you can put it together by giving it two sets of limbs and ears and eyes and um, and on all the tiles, there's different animals featured. So there's, you know, we have the eye of a uh, human eye. Uh, we've got a nautilus, mm -hmm. a cat, a lizard, etc. Yeah. So now you're seeing all examples of how nature makes eyes um, that are giving you ideas. The thing is that once you move into um, down a certain line, mm -hmm. then if you so you're going to crisscross, you can add to somebody else's animal. Yeah. Um, the, the body parts will return to just an anagram, mm -hmm. like uh, just a jumble of letters. Yeah. So it's just a jumble of body parts. Mm -hmm. So if you have a four-legged thing that doesn't yet have um, a, its body covering on it yet, so if it doesn't have hair or scales on it yet, yeah. the second you put scales on it, mm -hmm. suddenly you're not going to make a mammal. Okay. You know, you're into a reptile, right. or you're going to put um, make it slimy, and suddenly, um, you know, you're going to go over and you're going to make a frog. Right. Um, this is uh, an amphibian. This is a, a way of starting to realize how these animals group together, right. and that there's sort of choices where suddenly you go down the end and that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. However, you do be able to you when you make the crossword on it. If mm -hmm. you cross an animal, for example, you can go to the end of somebody's four-legged um, animal, mm -hmm. or, you know, it's got limbs and wings, and it could have been a bird, uh -huh. but actually, you if it doesn't have a beak yet on it, then right. you can put uh, sonar, and you can make a bat, right, right, right. and you could cross a dolphin, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. you could make a dolphin as well, so you're going to score for both points. Think, so yeah. the whole idea is, you know, suddenly you've got this game, and lots of people don't know these different features. Mm -hmm. I mean, some do and some don't. It really depends. Or you might know about one type of animal but not the other. Right, yeah. You know, um, you can go and make something and you've got, suddenly you've got a, um, if you've got four sets of limbs, mm -hmm. you could have um, 
a spider, mm -hmm. or you can have an octopus. Uh -huh. But then, you know, the person who's going to go and put beak on right. and claim it's an octopus, it, other people are going to be like, wait, it, an octopus has a beak? Right. And you're like, yeah, or wait, platypus have stingers? Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's the whole way to start the discussion going. Yeah. And, you know, really all ages can play this because not everybody knows about every single animal unless, yeah. of course, you're, you know, you're with the PhDs and then, of course, but even still, yeah. they, they can play at a different level. So you yeah. can have somebody who is quite, you know, a preschooler play with their older brother or cousin or something and, you know, the parent and a grandparent and each one of them are going to bring a different set of knowledge right. and uh, and creativity to yeah. this yeah the really nice way of learning animals and nature i think it's a social way i mean mm -hmm. play is a very social thing and you know one of my uh big favorites is uh Stugata mitra on ted talking about the soul self-organized uh -huh. learning environments and to me uh the game is really a soul in itself mm -hmm. um you're getting people around where they're, they're, it's a group learning situation, but it's also, it's not just group learning like, oh, we're here to learn, yeah, it's play. Yeah, yeah. And so you're sort of tricking people into learning, which I like, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the whole, I think the whole thing is that when, when you play, mm -hmm. you're engaging in this sort of creative thought. And that's something that I think is an extremely powerful yeah. thing that we underestimate right. how free we think under those conditions. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That problem solving, that that's something our brains love all these puzzles right, and things. Right, right. They love finding these new connections. Right. Okay, so there is a counterpart to uh, Anagrammit. Uh, in Anagrammit, you're going to construct an animal from body parts. Mm -hmm. And we've been working on an app, um, which we have to rename because somebody took the name, called Animaker. Mm -hmm. But anyway, as the working title, the thing that will be Animaker, uh, that's actually a, a huge idea. It, and it came about as a very funny situation. Mm -hmm. So when I started designing toys, I really needed to find, uh, okay, so how am I going to find my way around 1.7 million species? How am I going to get the story so that you can, you know, figure out what's exciting? Like, for example, I designed a card game called Old Maid, mm -hmm. and the Old Maid is the ginkgo tree in the card game. So it's made with trees, yeah. and it's because she has no children. Mm -hmm. You know, she's a living fossil. She didn't, like Magnolia... Um, and angiosperms go on to have all of these other different types of things come from her. It's just ginkgo, ginkgo, ginkgo all the way down the Linnaean taxonomy with different mm -hmm. Latin names going to the end. Um, so in trying to figure out my way around this, you know, there was a I was looking for a cheat sheet that biologists might have, mm -hmm. uh, botanists or zoologists, uh, to uh, classify all these animals, and there was nothing. And so... Uh, here I am, and I'm a total outsider. I'm an artist and a designer, and I have to find my way around so I can design these toys and really pick and choose from different types. You know, I want to go into how nature makes uh, patterns, how she makes structures, how she makes colors. This is a big, this is, you know, a decade of work, at least, mm -hmm. to be yeah. able to take a 4-year-old to a 14-year-old and through toys, games, and apps, be able to teach them the tree of life so that yeah. they can zoom in and out like Google Earth, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, with this E, go down the, um, the tree. So what ended up happening was that I made a cheat sheet for myself, and the more I looked at it, and I actually had the luxury of showing Edward Tufte this work, mm -hmm. and I don't know if you know his work, he's a big data visualization, mm -hmm. he's sort of the father of all of this. Yeah. So... You don't get an audience with him uh, every day of the week. Uh, so I showed him the game, and I showed him the system that I was building it on. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, this is a really big idea. Yeah. You realize how big this is. Mm -hmm. uh, what I had done was I had created my cheat sheet was a periodic table mm -hmm. for botany and for zoology. Oh, okay. So that now you can actually, the same way you can make uh, NaCl to be the formula for salt, mm -hmm. you can now actually make a formula for a snow leopard oh, okay. or for a chameleon. Right. And it was, uh, when I showed it to him at this time, he said, do you realize how much work this is going to be? This is insane. I said, yes. He said, well, if you do it, then you really will have moved the needle forward. Um, so this was a very exciting thing. You know, he mentioned some big prize that I might get in science, and I said, oh, I almost fell over. <laughs> um, but so the thing that's exciting about this is that ultimately – it was, again, the way I started realizing that I really was a, an inventor. Um, and that's what they call people in the, in the gaming industry. Right. You're a game inventor. Yep. Um, but I was an inventor because 
I had taken this thing and I realized, what am I going to do with this? Okay. Do we print this up and make it like the periodic table? How are people going to use it? And I thought, duh, I'm so stupid. It's a game. Yeah. So it's an iPad game. Yeah. And we will be releasing it in December. Oh. Um, instead of building the animal, you're deconstructing. So if you take a snow leopard, then you have to decide how it's inside, yeah. vertebrate or invertebrate. Yeah. Uh, what's its outside like? Is it hairy or sca scaly or spiny or feathered? Yeah. On the bottom. And this um, is very exciting because we've got um, five-year-olds who can, if they have, there's pictures on it as well. So you, everything, again, it goes back to visual reasoning. Um, cool, cool. And being able to mm -hmm. uh, put these uh, concepts together just by seeing right. and forming. The whole idea is that if you can see it, uh -huh. then you can start understanding it. You can start grouping it together in your mind. Right. And then you can start this dialogue in and out between you know how you're conceiving it and what's out there. Yep. The, the ultimate idea was to take very small children and help them learn the world around them, you know, mm -hmm. my daughter and everything when she's four, yeah. uh, how, do, how do you explain, you know, these, you, you get a random fact about a spider and a random fact about this, mm -hmm. where do you file all that information? Yeah. And I started thinking, you know, children who have great access to um, their own minds, how they really just understand how, um, where everything fits, is that the, the classification system was going to be basically a way for uh, them to organize their brains, slot in all of these facts, start mm -hmm. making all of the connections in between them, mm -hmm. so that they can really build something, so then they can start thinking. Right. Because the thing is that, that knowledge is a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you do with it is what happens after. And I think we spend so much time in education stuffing the stuff in, yeah. that that's the primary activity. Now, if mm -hmm. we can make the, 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 the acquisition of knowledge mm -hmm. easy and elegantly structured in your mind, yes. then you can start the real work. Yep, yep. That's when you start having the fun. And so yep. the whole idea was to take, you know, a biology class mm -hmm. from a 12-year-old and drop it down to a 4-year-old because that's when they really want to know all this stuff. Yep. Yep. So let's talk a bit about the uh, design side of yourself. Ooh. Oh, so uh, what, what are my big ideas in design? Yeah, what's, what's your design philosophy or how, how did it shape over the years? Because I see a lot of uh, trends that go up and fade away, but there are some fundamentals that stick along. It doesn't matter what design that you do. So what's your design philosophy? In uh, Okay, so I really feel that there's a lot of missed opportunities mm -hmm. and that uh, multi-use things are, that's one of my big uh, passions is to get you to be able to use things in many different ways. Mm -hmm. um, in games, for example, that would be called an open-ended game, mm -hmm. and that's why, to a certain extent, I don't like these games where they shove you down a funnel okay. to get some prize at the end. Uh -huh. I like a game the diving board that lets you open out to many different things. Right. So I think the best design in my mind mm -hmm. has um, uh, simplicity, mm -hmm. And uh, obviously within that simplicity is sort of elegance, right. but also um, a, an expansiveness, mm -hmm. which is a sort of, you know, more profound thing. Like, well, what could this be? Um, and how is it functioning with, um, w with its environment? How mm -hmm. does it add? Um, okay. You know, it, it's interesting in sculpture. So mm -hmm. part of my design philosophy is coming from sculpture, mm -hmm. and that's a very sensual um type of activity. Mm -hmm. uh, you are physically in space with something, even if it's the performance that's light, you're having a physical reaction to it. Right. And um, I coached, uh, was coached for, uh, many years by Jerry Colonna, mm -hmm. who uh, is great at naming what people are. And he said, you are a sensualist. Right. And it made so much sense to me. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons was that uh, the sensual experience, experience of things, uh, like when I was making sculpture, one of the things I wanted you to do, I used uh, rich colors and textures and things, is okay. I wanted you to almost have a feeling in your hand or your body mm -hmm. um, through seeing something that would connect you okay. and make you want to be to touch this object. You know, there's lots of art you can't touch, but I only ever wanted to make the art that you could touch, that okay. you could... You know, for my senior thesis at RISD, I made um, a fake fur room with a carpet and walls and 
mm-hmm. had this gorgeous girl lying on a chaise lawn covered in different um, laces. And it was very, very bright colors. Okay. Um, so that sensuality, I think, is um, a big key. Mm-hmm. Right. And then also the, 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 the playfulness mm-hmm. of sign. I think that there's, there's, it's, the design should wink at you. You know, it yep. should it should it should have a sense of humor, mm-hmm. um, even if it has a gravity. And right. I think that those that balancing the yin and yang, mm-hmm. um, finding the integrity of uh, those kind of things in the work is is very important. Sure, sure. And you you talk about um, playfulness and colors, right? Um, as a UI designer myself, I struggle a lot with colors. How do you choose colors? And even more important, how do you know if you have chosen the right shade of the color that you want. Okay, so um, an interesting thing is that uh, I was very uh, super 3D when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. I was, um, don't ask me why, but when I was 12, I was taken out to do skeet shooting, and I was like a 7 out of 10 shot, which is very high for a girl. Um, So girls who have this hyper 3D, first of all, were very rare. Mm -hmm. Um, But second of all, hyper 3D is a really interesting thing. just on how, how you're moving around. And I was an athlete, so that also I had a lot of kinetic um, experiencing of things. I think that's a, also probably a reason my sculpture attracted me a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then the next thing the, to connect that to is that when I went to RISD to study sculpture, I had just declared my major. Mm-hmm. And I found out that I had uh, an eye condition, which children have called strabismus. And mm-hmm. so when you see uh, a child with a patch on one eye, mm-hmm. it means it's starting to stray either, you know, inward or outward, and it's right. a muscular condition. Mm-hmm. Now, this is actually what Picasso had. Um, yeah. This is where cubism comes from, yeah. and uh, it's really fantastic. I there was a great show at the um, Guggenheim this winter mm-hmm. on um, Picasso. Uh, to me, it's very natural. Cub- the way he sees cubism to me is sort of, you know, because I see two of everything now. Yeah. So this was this very bizarre thing that happened in art school where um, I'm in a 3D profession. I spent my whole life being a hyper 3D child, and now I can have to be waived from perspective drawing because I can't actually reproduce it for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I'm seeing two of everything all the time. Mm-hmm. So I figured out a way to reorganize my brain. I'd always been uh, very good at color. Mm-hmm. That was one of the things that uh, color vision, you know, you can either you can get varying degrees of how good at it you are, or, you know, whether you're colorblind in certain um, formats. So what ended up happening for me was that I put together the uh, the color understanding with the lack of the 3D mm-hmm. that I was having, right. and I made myself a way to understand the space more mm-hmm. by really understanding how the color was reacting to the light. What does your workspace look like? Is it uh, clean and organized or messy and chaotic or somewhere in between? Uh, we have a very clean, while well, you're looking mm-hmm. at the uh, the workspace here, I work at home. Uh-huh. And uh, this is something that actually a lot of people can manage quite happily and others cannot at all. Yes. Um, so basically we try and keep it in when it's we're not in massive project mode Mm -hmm. so that we can actually see the bottom of the dining room table um and but it's a a a small clean very bright fun space Mm -hmm. and uh we're high up and have light on two sides and a little outdoor space and uh so there's just a a sort of there's something exciting about the space and uh so in in making a home and this is you you get to a point where your life is not separable from your work Mm -hmm. at least if you are coming up in the way i am with these ideas um i don't i don't i guess need that separation Mm -hmm. it's too messy to pull apart so this whole concept of the work-life balance for example that jerry guana talks about Uh, the work-life balance, it's, you know, it's, to me, it's all just grown into a great, um, a great blog. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so it's nice to be able to see, I think, the personal intertwined with the work. Right. Yeah, I I can completely relate to that. Uh, What are some of the productivity hacks that you follow? You you need to be able to juggle a lot of things, right? Um, So if you could share some of the productivity hacks that you follow, it would be really great. 
Well, I think that you have to choose uh, as few things as you can get by with mm -hmm. and make them really smart. Uh, for example, uh, we are an all Apple household, so we've got our, uh, we seem to have, I don't know at this point, a bunch of uh, different laptops, uh, the iPad and uh, iPhones. To me, that's something that, uh, you know, there's there's lots of other things happening with Android, and um, it, it, I really don't have uh, the desire to have to hack my own phone, so I'm, I'm pretty happy with what Apple does. That's good enough for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think just not having a lot of stuff, I mean, you know, productivity hack is you don't need a spatula and a cheese grater. You just need a cheese grater that you can use as a spatula. Yeah. Not the, I mean, sorry, not the grater, the cheese slicer. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. you can flip an egg with that. You know, it's, you, you don't really need as, I think we don't need as many things as we think we need. Mm -hmm. I think we're all drowning in stuff. Mm -hmm. And half of that is because if you don't look hard enough to solve not just a single problem, but maybe many problems at once, if you have that open-ended look to something, then you realize that um, you can use it for something else, and then you know you're just not going to be drowning in stuff. Yeah. Okay. So, we are down to my final question, which is: um, Could you share one? If you have to share one ultimate bit of wisdom that you have learned throughout the years, what would be it? Yeah. Well, I think that uh, play to me has been where uh, where we are at heart. Mm -hmm. um, the more I become in, involved in the thinking of uh, game design, toy design, uh, learning, um, new forms of learning, uh, how we're engaging children uh, at school, how we're engaging them at home, uh, how they connect with their peers, how we connect with them. The play is really a core, and animals who play successfully mm -hmm. are the ones who survive better. Mm -hmm. uh, but it goes a little bit deeper than that, I think. Um, Play, in the end, is the place where we need to move our modern thinking if we're all going to be talking about and reading articles about and worried about uh, create, creating a group, uh, a generation that can think creatively, that can problem solve, um, that has the excitement and the energy to do something. That basically, it, it has to be playful, and part of that, I guess, is because it has to be fun. And that's the interesting thing is that the way we think mm -hmm. uh, and the way we really use our, our engage our minds, yeah. uh, it, that excitement is what gets us going. That's what gets us up every morning to do the work that we do. Yeah. So I would say if you're not having fun, you're not doing it. Right. Th thanks so much for the interview, Alex. Uh,